Hello and welcome to lesson 15 for an inspector course. Um, today we will be looking at the theme of the generation gap or generation divide, however you want to call it. Um, so our title is the generation divide, so you need to copy that down into your exercise books. And then I want you to have a look at the picture on the screen. And this is a picture of the generation gap. And the generation gap isn't something that is just strictly in an inspector course. It's something that we actually kind of deal with all the time. It's just basically how society progresses and changes so that what the older generation would be accustomed to um, would be very different to what the younger generation would be accustomed to. So, for instance, like phones, um, like you might have like grandparents or great grandparents who just don't use mobile phones or they see it as kind of like something new and that they have to kind of get used to. Whereas you guys have kind of grown up with them. You don't actually know a time without mobile phones. That's a generation divide. Um, so what I would like you to do is list how many differences you can spot between the young and the old man. So, for instance, if you look at um, how they listen to music. So the old man is using something to listen to music. I'll be interested to see if you know what it is. Um, and the young man is listening to music. And these are kind of generational divides that what one person is used to do using just based on like when they were, how old they are, basically. Um, and once you've done that, I would like you to think for a little bit about any generational divides within your own family. So kind of think about how maybe your views on marriage, technology or the environment differ from your grandparents or people who are older than you within your family. So pause the video and start thinking about the generation divide. So we're going to have a look at the generational divide within the Burling family. Um, so as we said previously, the inspector's final speech is delivered just to the Burling family. So Gerald has gone out for a walk at this point, and it's really key that it is just the Burling family that are hearing this speech because he's looking at different generations here. So you have the older generation, of Mr and Mrs Burling who are listening to the speech and then you're looking at the younger generation Eric and Sheila Burling who are also listening to the speech and Priestley has kind of done this because he's essentially looking at this as the future so the older generation are the ones who are responsible for the certain like circumstances that they're in and he's looking at Eric and Sheila and the younger generation who are potentially watching the play to be the ones who should make changes and this is quite common it's um like a common belief that kind of like the younger generation are going to be the ones to solve all of the world's problems and it's no different within Inspector Pools. Um, so we're going to have a look at different things and it's just a kind of one word answer for this, it doesn't need to be super detailed, but I would like you to copy out and complete the table below so you're looking at um, like whether or not they accept responsibility for Eva's death, do they learn from the inspector's visit, are they socialist or capitalist at the start, socialist or capitalist at the end. So I've started completing the one for Mr. Burling and I'd like you to finish it off and then complete the sections for Mrs. Burling, Eric and Sheila. And then have a look to see if you notice anything in particular about the older generation versus the younger generation. So pause the video, copy down and complete the table. OK, so when we're looking at the older generation versus the younger generation, you're basically looking at the older generation remain capitalist and deny responsibility from Eva's death and they do not learn from the inspector's visit, whereas the younger generation do. And this is reflected in their politics and it's looking at politics nowadays, for instance, in the 2017 general election, you're looking at um, in terms of who is voting Conservative, it is largely the older generation. So there's 69% of 70 plus year olds are voting for the Conservative Party. Whereas you can look at the younger generation, so 18 to 19 year olds, are largely voting for socialist parties. So the Labour Party is typically associated with socialism um, and you have 66 percent of 18 to 19 year olds. So they're the ones who have just gotten the right to vote are voting for the Conservative, um, for the Labour Party even. Whereas the Conservative Party, who are typically associated with capitalist ideas, it's largely the older generation who are voting for them. So there seems to be some sort of crossover age here when they've looked into the like how they can predict who's going to vote for what. 
that around the age of 47 is when you kind of see this gradual drop off of people voting for Labour and starting to vote Conservative. Um, and that it's seen as for every 10 years older a person is, the more likely they are to vote Conservative. So if you are very, very, very old, you're very, very, very likely to vote Conservative. So we're looking now at this younger and older generation within an inspector calls. So Eric and Sheila represent the younger generation who would have been more likely to be socialist. So at the start of the play, they are both capitalists. However, by the end of the play, they become socialists. And you can see this within these quotations. And it might be idea for you to copy these down. But if you do get a question about the generation gap, you're, you're immediately ready with quotations. So for Eric, for instance, you have this conversation between Gerald and Eric um, and Mr. Burling too, when Mr. Burling is kind of talking about um, how unlikely it is that there's going to be war. And Gerald says, I believe you're right. And Gerald is always in agreement with Mr. Burling. He remains a capitalist as well. Um, Eric, however, says, what about war? So he's starting to have this kind of doubts about whether or not he should just blindly believe the older generation's views. And he's starting to question them. But it's always coming back to this idea of him being half shy, half assertive. That he's never fully committed to really arguing his opinion or his point, um, point across. Um, and then in Act 3, you have that quotation, we did her in all right. So it's showing that he has become socialist and that he is taking responsibility for his actions, but also believes in collective responsibility, which is an idea of socialism. That it isn't just him who's entirely responsible, but actually it's society that has failed Eva Smith. Um, looking at Sheila, you're looking at, in Act 1, I've tried to do this both about the rings. So you have here, you can see that, um, you're looking at how excited she is to see the ring. So she's kind of like, look at it, mummy. Um, isn't this a beauty? So you have several things to point out here. So the fact that she's calling it mummy. Um, and then Act 3, she calls her mother, showing that she's kind of matured. Um, but she's quite materialistic. She's very excited to have an engagement ring and that it's so pretty and beautiful. It's all quite shallow. It's on, on the surface. Um, whereas in Act 3, you have this final exchange between um, Gerald and Sheila. And this is kind of like the last thing that they say to each other um, is when Gerald says everything's all right now, Sheila, which shows that he hasn't changed or learnt from the inspector's visit says what about this ring so he's still expecting to get married to her he still thinks that they can go back to normal um, and Sheila says no not yet it's too soon I must think so there's this suggestion here from Priestley that she isn't willing to either immediately say no it's definitely not going to happen but also yes it definitely will happen that she's kind of matured and she wants to make her own mind up without being swayed by her fiance or her parents or society either our capitalist characters, however, Arthur and Sybil and Gerald, um, so Mr and Mrs Burling and Gerald, are capitalists at the start and they are capitalists at the end. They care about themselves, they don't learn from the inspector's visit and they expect everything to go back to normal as soon as the inspector goes. And they are the ones who are kind of quite happy to laugh and joke about the idea of the inspector being a hoax or a joke. Um, rather than actually take on board any kind of responsibility or feelings that they kind of did any wrong by Eva Smith. So Gerald is kind of an interesting character. So I would make notes on this in my exercise book for you, because when you look at the generation gap, you kind of have within the Burling family, the older generation are clearly capitalist. They're interested in themselves and they are um, kind of just they don't learn from the inspector's visit and you're looking at the younger generation so Eric and Sheena and they do but Gerald is a younger generation but he doesn't learn and so he needs to think well what is it about Gerald that makes him different from Eric and Sheila which means that he doesn't take on board the inspector's message and he doesn't learn from the experience and the answer to that is basically that he's the most upper class character in the play so his father is Lord Croft so when um, he dies, Gerald would become Lord Croft, and Sheila, if she married him, would be Lady Croft. So they're titled, they're knighthoods, they're like fairly up there. 
Um, and he symbolises the persistence of the upper class so that they have too much wealth, power and privilege to want to lose it. So Priestley is kind of acknowledging that the upper classes aren't going anywhere. And he isn't kind of asking for a complete social overhaul. Like we still have a royal family today in 2020. And that's part of the class structure is that you have a monarchy who are kind of above the rest of us. Um, and he isn't kind of asking us to be like completely radical and just completely change society. He's acknowledging that there are going to be people like Gerald who remain capitalist and that not everybody is going to be swayed by the changes within society and become socialist. And he's like saying that this will happen. He isn't saying it's OK because Gerald kind of looks a bit desperate in his last line when he's like, so we're we going to get married. And Julie's like, no. Um, so there is kind of like the sly dig from Priestley there. Um, however, he is kind of acknowledging that it isn't always going to be socialist and things will sl slightly go back to capitalist ways, which is reflected in the politics. So you had um, a Conservative Party during the war led by Churchill. Labour were voted in with Clement Attlee and you had the introduction of the NHS followed by um, following the beverage report. You had a lot of socialist innovation, but then they returned to the Conservative Party and we still have a Conservative government in power at the moment. So he's acknowledging that it isn't always going to be super duper socialist. There's always going to be capitalist ideas. Um, however, that there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement of the need for socialism. That You cannot have an entirely capitalist society and we don't have an entirely capitalist society. We still have socialist ideals. We still have the NHS, we still have free education up to the age of 18, that kind of thing. Um, so what you need to do now is in your workbook, so we're not completing copy the play anymore. Um, you are going to be completing the page, I think it's page 19 on the generation divide. If you don't have your own copy of the workbook, then there's a copy available on SharePoint and your teacher may have attached a copy of it to the email that they've sent you today's lesson but we're basically looking at completing this table and I'm going to talk you through these slides and these characters and what I suggest you do is complete the table as we go along basically. Um, I'm looking at Sybil Verling and the generation divide. She represents the stubborn upper class older generation who are unwilling to change. So she's prejudiced against Eva Smith simply because she is working class. And you have several quotations to choose from here. So, for instance, the fact that she's upper class, we have her husband's social superior. So we have this suggestion from the outset that she is within the Burling family, the, the highest class member. Uh, we then have girls of that class. So this quotation is a key quotation in showing her prejudice towards Eva Smith. So she doesn't even say working class, she just says that class um, and kind of that she isn't even going to lower herself to talk about somebody being working class, let alone the circumstances that they're living in. And it's really reflecting the distance between the reality of upper class and working class people in 1912. Um, we also have the fact that she says, I think she only had herself to blame and she was giving herself ridiculous airs. These are kind of linked because they are both looking at how Mrs. Burling believes in individual responsibility. So she pretty much is very keen on finding one person to blame for Eva Smith's suicide. And she starts off with Eva Smith um, and then moves on to the father. But she is definitely against and just refuses to even possibly acknowledge the idea of collective responsibility, this idea that everybody within the Burling family has in some way contributed to Eva Smith's suicide. Um, we then have this quotation. Um, you know, of course, my husband was Lord Mayor. So that is her trying to influence the inspector. She believes that using titles and using positions of power within society will kind of influence him positively and that she is clearly used to essentially name dropping her way out of problems, um, which again shows this idea of the upper class members of the older generation just seeing that they were untouchable, basically, that they had so much protection by their privilege and by their power 
that they could do no wrong and certainly not get into trouble from it. Um, and lastly, this is, I think, the most interesting one when it comes to Mrs. Burling. Um, this is her response when they're kind of laughing about how the inspector wasn't real. And um, she says, I was the only one of you not to give in to him. So she is kind of quite up herself, basically, is the only way I can think of putting it. But even within this circumstance, when her family are kind of panicking and thinking about kind of, well, we're going to go to prison. And like we were taken in by this man and like we thought it was all a hoax and they're going through all of these emotions. And she's basically standing back and gloating about the fact that she was the only one who refused to take any responsibility for what happened. Even Mr. Burling, I mean, admittedly, after a lot of persuasion, <laughs> gives in and is kind of like, I'd give thousands. Yes, thousands. He acknowledges that, you know, he did something wrong. And he says, you know, yes, I was like, I did something wrong, but um, I'm not entirely to blame. And you can kind of see where he's coming from, whereas Mrs. Burling is throughout refusing point blank to take any responsibility. And even after the inspector's gone, she's kind of like almost laughing at her family for being weak enough to give in. She's that cold, basically, as pretty she put it. Then we have Sheila Burling. So at the start of the play, she's materialistic and shallow. So you have the um, stage direction at the start here. She's a pretty girl. She's very pleased with life, rather excited. So you kind of think about from Sheila's perspective, she considers this to be like the start of the rest of her life and her adventure with Gerald. And it all just comes to a crashing halt very quickly. Um, but she's very impressionable. And impressionable basically means that she learns lessons very quickly. Um, and she really does take on board the inspector's visit and she becomes the most socialist member of the play. And a lot of what she says is basically just repeating what the inspector says. Um, so, for instance, this is from Act One. So her response to her father talking about labour prices and she humanises the workforce. So she says these girls aren't cheap labour, they're people. And this is showing the young generation were socialists that they saw the humanity in the working class and that they were kind of more willing to take on board the feelings and thoughts of people that worked for them rather than just seeing them as numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, she acknowledges that she did something wrong so she takes responsibility so again that's a reminder of her being socialist and that she won't do it again which is quite significant bearing in mind how quickly the older generation go back to how they were before and basically want to just continue acting as they were before the inspector came. Sheila openly says, I'll never, never do it again. Um, and it's this acknowledgement here. It frightens me the way you talk when she is just outright confronting the older generation and how blasé they are about the whole situation that they don't seem to have taken on board anything the inspector said that they are willing to repeat their mistakes and they're not going to learn their lesson, as the inspector said. So now we're going to look at the older generation. So you have Arthur Burling. Um, so you're looking a heavy looking, rather portentous man in his middle 50s is this um, opening stage direction for him. And he is the older generation who is capitalist. So he's only concerned about himself and his reputation. He's unwilling to change his mind. You have um, from Act One, a lot of quotations to do with the power and privilege which upper class people had in those times. So even just saying that he's heavy looking um, is kind of just a reminder that he's quite substantial. That I mean, it's basically a way of saying he's not fat, but he's got a, a physical presence on the stage. Um, then you have I'm talking as a hard headed, practical man of business. Um, and he uses this word business quite a lot. Um, that he is very tied up in like the economy and making money and he is more concerned with that than he is about individual people. Um, and there are people indeed in our government today who kind of have that kind of mentality. And there is an importance for that, that they're taking on board kind of that we need 
an economy in order to survive. But there's also that reminder from Sheila and more socialist characters that there's a human side to this, that when we're looking at numbers on a spreadsheet, that's all well and good. But we also need to remember that they're people. Um, and here he is um, openly acknowledging that he thinks that socialism is a stupid idea. Um, and he tries to belittle it by saying that it's as if we were all mixed up together like bees in a hive, community and all that nonsense. Um, so he's almost um, being presented as kind of like a caricature of socialism, but he is ridiculing it by saying it's all of these things that were like bees in a hive and community. But you could easily see being bees in a hive and working together in a community as being quite positive things, but in his mind, they're very negative. Um, so he can't even acknowledge that there is any positives within socialism, um, which is, I think, what Priestley's warning is, that if you have an entirely capitalist society, there is no humanity there. There's no kind of care and consideration for one another, um, which is also reflected in the dramatic irony associated with Mr Burning. It's the arrogance of the older generation, this idea that they think they know everything. And he is saying all of these things definitely won't happen. So he thinks that the Titanic is unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. Um, but he um, is talking about the war and is under the impression that, that there's a lot of silly talk going on. So again, this idea that he thinks that it's just out of the question that it would even happen. Um, and then you have that reminder from the younger generation that he said when Eric says, well, what about war? The younger generation are a bit more clued into what's happening than the older generation are. That's all coming back to the generational divide. Um, lastly, I'm looking at Eric. So he has some socialist ideas at the start of the play and he is too shy to challenge his father fully. So he is this quotation that we've looked at quite a few times now. Half shy, half assertive. Whereas at the end of the play, so here, for instance, when he says, I'm ashamed of you, it's quite a big thing to say to your parents. He isn't saying it kind of in a tantrum or just to get a rise out of them. It's something that he genuinely believes. Um, and if you think about saying that to your parents nowadays, there would be even stricter rules about kind of decorum and how you should behave in 1912. So this is a big deal for him to have said that to his parents. Um, so here we're looking at his socialist ideas at the start of the play and his socialist ideas at the end of the play. Most of his socialist ideas at the start are questions. So this is what I mean about him having some socialist ideas. He isn't fully committed to socialism. There's, it's almost like it's growing within him. And the inspector is kind of the one that kind of lets it loose, I guess, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, but he's just asking questions of his parents and his um, the older generation. He doesn't feel like he has the answers yet. However, he also feels like they certainly don't have the answers either. Um, whereas at the end, it's their statements and they're quite strong statements that he's making. He isn't asking questions anymore. Um, here we have his description of his association with Eva Smith. So that idea that he wasn't in love with her or anything, but I liked her, which was a pretty and good support. Um, so in terms of the younger generation, the younger generation aren't perfect. And with quotations like this, and also with Gerald's ideas about her being pretty, you're looking at the younger generation's view of women that it isn't entirely equal, basically, that they still had the same mentality that their parents had and the older generation had towards women. So you'd have like Alderman McGarty, old Joe McGarty, who would be regularly sexually harassing women. But men of all ages of both younger and older generation would go to the palace theatre bar and like pick up prostitutes and young women, basically. So when you're looking at the older and the younger generation, yes, there is a clear divide with their politics. Um, However, in terms of their attitude towards women, the younger men and the older men are kind of united in that regard. Once you have filled in that table, so you'll notice that there's five and I'm only giving you four characters. Um, it's up to you whether you double up 
and look at so for instance i would look at the fifth one as being how the there isn't really that much of a gap in terms of older and younger men and their attitudes towards women um, alternatively you can use your notes on gerald and have a look at how he is presented it's up to you um, but what i would like you to do now is write a paragraph underneath the table there's a little line space it says we're going to write a paragraph together and if we were all in a classroom, we would have done, but we're not together. Um, but you're going to write a paragraph summing up how the generation gap is presented in the play. Um, and the main things that you need to get across within that paragraph are the older generation. So Mr. Burning and Mrs. Burning's political views. So are they socialist, capitalist, beginning and end? And how you know that? Then we're looking at how Eric and Sheila's political views change. So they're how they start the play capitalist and end up socialist, or they're slightly socialist and end up fully socialist. Um, how Gerald stands out for the Burlings and why that might be. And you should aim to include four to five quotations within this paragraph so that whenever you make an assertion about a character or what their political views are, you're backing it up. Don't feel like you need to write the full quotation out either. You can just include snippets like one word bits just to really show that you know this play inside out and that is the end of today's lesson